On the morning of August 1, 1966, shots ring out from the observation deck of the clock tower on the University of Texas campus. It marks the infamous beginning of the modern era of mass shootings in America. I'm Sarah Ferris, true crime podcaster. And I'm Catherine Schweit, the former head of the FBI's active shooter program. And you're listening to Stop the Killing. This is a trigger warning for today's episode. It's an interview that I recorded with Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh from the LA Not So Confidential podcast. As is so often the way, we found ourselves down some interesting rabbit holes. So in this particular case, we began with discussing the path that led them both to their current careers and ended up having quite a lengthy conversation about their work within the sex offender prison population, which although fascinating, I know and recognize that it can be triggering for people. So that's why I've decided to split this episode into two. If you feel you do not need to hear a discussion around sex offenders, then next week's episode picks up the interview after that. Or if you're on Patreon or an Apple subscriber, it's out now for you. And speaking of Patreons, it's time that we welcome our newest members to our Patreon family. So welcome to Kathy Jezdemir, Michelle Skinner, Charlotte Grace, Russ, Becca, Cammie Bailey, Jackie Bradstone, and Colleen Dunn. Thank you all for your continued support. And if you want to join them and get ad-free early access plus bonus content, head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing. Or alternatively, if you're listening on Apple, simply click the subscribe button now. As always, the links will be in the show notes. Well, welcome to this episode of Stop the Killing. We've got some very special guests today and apologies for Catherine, who actually seems to have a life on a Saturday. How dare she? Oh, very dare she. She's dropped the ball and left Dr. Shiloh and Dr. Scott from LA Not So Confidential podcast with just me. I don't know. We might be replacing her. Catherine should Uh, have thought about this. (laughs) This is my time to shine. (laughs) We'll see. Let me ask you to both introduce yourselves because you've got quite the careers, both of you. Sure. I'll keep it short and then we can get into it wherever you want to along the way. Um, I'm Dr. Shiloh. I'm one half of the podcast LA Not So Confidential. And I am a forensic psychologist in Los Angeles. In forensic psychology, I have worked with the offender population getting out of prison with a whole myriad of different types of issues that they have been ordered to attend treatment on. And now I work in law enforcement psychology. So that is my everyday day job, which brings me full circle because I was a police officer before I was a psychologist. Wow, we are definitely coming back to put a pin in that one. That's an interesting transition. But let's go to Scott. Dr. Scott, tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment. So I am a forensic psychologist as well. Uh, I started out in in the field of psychology as a master's level clinician, what we call here in the States, a licensed marriage and family therapist. And about three quarters of the way through that process, I realized I wanted to get more education. So I pursued getting a doctorate, had no idea that my doctoral program had a heavy emphasis in forensics, especially family custody evaluations and expert witness, court engagement. So just sort of open my head to possibilities that I had no awareness that existed. And I was really unbelievably lucky, like just luck of the draw that I got an opportunity for a forensic full-time internship with Dr. Shiloh. And that's where we met. We were the only two, actually, there were four interns, but we were the only two that were doing Full time. So we were there Mm -hmm. with each other four to five days a week for a year with pre and post incarceration sex offenders, as well as individuals coming out of the prison system mandated for mental health care that have what we call dual diagnosis. So they had a pretty significant history of substance use issues along with a qualifying mental health condition. And it was the best training. I mean, just the most intense, wonderful training for a year. Shiloh stayed with that organization and continued in that forensic clinic. I went to 
California Department of Corrections for three years working in a mental health unit in the state prison system, and then worked at the world's largest mental health system within the jail system in the area where I live in Southern California. And now I'm working with law enforcement in a co-responder model. And my previous history is I was a professional dancer from college on until I got to be about 30. And then I transitioned into different parts of entertainment. I worked as a casting director, worked as a post-production supervisor, worked as a line producer in some different areas of DVD content. And I had a great gig, wonderful gig. And I was like, oh, this doesn't have a retirement. So I'm going to go back to grad school. Best decision I ever made. This has been a, a great career for me. Wow. That's quite fascinating, actually. Like you went very LA to begin with, didn't you? Very oh, jazz yes. hands <laughs> entry into it. But was there a aha moment that made you choose psychology? Or, I mean, because obviously you could have done anything, but what was it that drew you to that? Oh, the big thing was I did a show in Vegas as my career was kind of coming to an end. It's like everything was starting to hurt really bad. And I was on stage in Vegas and I got set on fire by one of the props. What? And then I, Hold yeah, on. I got, I caught on fire. The next night during a magic act, a, a sword like sliced above my eyebrow. And then the next night I oh was doing God. this big jump as it dressed as a genie, by the way. And my right. foot got caught in my harem pants and I fell and rolled off stage. And I was like, I get it. Universe it three, whatever is up there. It is time to get out. Yeah. yeah. And my therapist actually had been pushing me for years. He said, I think you would be really good at this. And I was like, nope not going to do it, not going to do it. And I went and took an intro class at the master's program. And within, within 10 minutes, I just felt like parts of my brain crackling that I hadn't been using in a long time and I was sold. So. Wow. That's very yeah. cool. What sort of age were you when you, you know, decided to go for a less flammable kind of career outfit? So it was about age 40. What a transition. But it did sound like you were just getting a little bit too slow at the end there with those, you know, swords hitting you in the face. And... <laughs> That's crazy. I get it. I was like, I was literally, I felt I was on my back. I get it. I get it. It's time. It's time to go. Three for three. It. I'm out. I'm out. One song. I've gone. Now let's, uh, let's flip that and ask you, Dr. Shiloh, because you didn't come into this with such a jazz hands entry for sure. I feel like you were. Oh, oh, she was Charlie's Angels. Charlie's She's Angels. She's like one of the Charlie's Angels. But also, am I right in saying it was slightly bred into you? Oh yeah, you're you're absolutely right. Um, and it's funny because of all, I'm such a planner. I'm such an organizer. I had my life for like the next decade planned out, and for all of those efforts, I never wanted to be a cop. I never intended on being a psychologist. Like how I've landed here. And yeah. I'm just super happy and content with what I do is beyond me. You know, my parents and particularly my mom being a, a female cop in the 70s was such a trailblazer. And I'd grown up around the dinner table with extraordinary stories of working as deputies here in Los Angeles, which is one of our big agencies out here. But I think most kids want to do something kind of bigger and better than what their parents did. So I had the interest of law enforcement investigation and just kind of what does that all mean for human behavior. But I didn't want to be a cop. I really just like there was nothing in me that was like street cop is what I want to be. So I went to college. I double majored in criminal justice and psychology in undergrad. And I had my eyes set on going to work for the California Department of Justice, which is like California's mini version of the FBI. Ooh, so yeah. they, you can go in with just a bachelor's degree and be a special agent and start your trajectory there. But when I graduated from college, the whole state of California was on a hiring freeze. So here I was. I was working part time as a police cadet, just a job for college students to kind of see what it's like behind the scenes at the police department. And I was working part time at Starbucks. <laughs> and I thought, you know, as the months ticked by, I'm like, OK. I have my degrees. I need to get a real job. So I started setting my sights on the FBI. I said, I'll just go federal then. Um, but you needed experience. You couldn't just do it with a degree. So 
I definitely was an attorney. I wasn't a linguist. I wasn't an accountant. So law enforcement, it was. Those were kind of the tracks you could go under. So I had gone to my captain and said, if I put in for police officer, would you guys consider hiring me? But I think they knew it was a stepping stone for me. And he said, we would love to have you. Just give me four good years if I invest in you. And I thought in my head, that's perfect because that's all you need to apply to the FBI. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah. So I worked patrol for seven years. I stayed on for seven years. Absolutely loved it. We're not take it back for the world. For a very small city in Southern California, I was involved in two officer involved shootings while on the job, which I think there were only three the in like a 10 year period. Two of them were ones I was involved in. So some very traumatic experiences. But, you know, I stayed so long because I went back to grad school. And said, I'm going to go get my doctorate because the FBI can't turn me down if I'm Dr. Shiloh. <laughs> sure. So that was my plan. Um, and my most of my internships leading up to the one Dr. Scott and I did were in forensics. I had worked with sex offenders at a different location. Then I studied neuropsychology for a year and then came back around to sex offender work because I found it so interesting. And that's where Scott and I met. And um, that last year we were in internship. I mean, no wonder we're best friends 15 years later because we were trauma bonded, really getting through a trying time of your life together. And I, on top of all of that, was processing with the FBI as well. And they had given me a conditional job offer. And here I was at this crossroads of like, this is what I've been wanting to do forever. And then where we worked gave me a job offer. And I thought, oh my gosh, I really love what I'm doing here. And if I don't really want to go to another academy and they can send me wherever the hell they want to send me. <laughs> so, you know, I had a mentor. He had, he's still for 20 something years been my law enforcement mentor. And he was the assistant FBI agent in charge at the Los Angeles field office. And he said, I can't even guarantee you come back here. And once he said that, I was like, I'm going to go this psychology route because I love the forensic work that I'm doing. When I got to that third year where I was with Scott, everything shifted because our training was so incredible. The way in which I understood what our mission was to assess risk, to do these psychological assessments these risk assessments for future reoffense and how you turn that into a treatment plan to re re try and reduce recidivism of any other victims being created. It just, it, it felt like there was some purpose behind it. Finally, that was something that was shared with us by our clinical director is like, this is very real safety of the community is on the line. People's lives are on the line. We had us work with a psychiatrist who was a fascinating individual and she was probably one of the most humanitarian psychiatrists I've ever met, especially working within this particular mandated population, because, you know, the public doesn't want to talk about this icky stuff, especially because it has to do with sexuality. And we are a very Puritan country still yeah. to this day. This is fascinating and working with sex offenders and Shiloh and I would process this all the time is there's a whole spectrum of sex offenders that get pulled into mandated treatment. I mean, generally the groups were set up so that it would be, well, this group is for collectors of illegal child endangerment sex photographs. This group is for sexually violent predators. There is very little overlap in those two groups, but they both fall under this padding of sex offenders. So you have to shift focus between the groups. And then every once in a while, you would have a group that had elements of all three different populations. And so it's like, like the, the circus act of spinning plates and keeping tensions down in the room so that one, well, I did this, but at least I didn't do that. I'm not as bad as you. There was a lot of that uh, kind of yeah. uh, projection of blame. Sliding scale of horrific crimes. Yeah. You know, that is such a monumental responsibility that you are like the gatekeepers for communities and, and safekeeping. Do you know, once you've sat down with these sex offenders, you've 
done the report for them, if they were to reoffend, would there be any way that you would find that back out? Because it's a huge responsibility, and I just want to know how you would handle that pressure if it did. Yeah. Come out. Well, by no means is it perfect system because we're talking about human beings and behavior here. So. You know, you have a certain amount of confidence in the assessments and the assessment tools and learning how to use those appropriately to where you go, okay, like here's the people in the clinic that are the low risk offenders. You have your moderate risk and you have your high risk. And in California, we have what's called a containment model, which is if you picture a triangle, each one of the points of the triangle is a different part of the system that's containing this offender who would be in the middle. So you have the psychologist at one point, you have the probation officer at one point, and then you have the polygraph examination as another point, because depending on their level of risk, they will get polygraphed every few months. So it helps lead treatment in the way it needs to go. It also helps their probation officer realize where they need to sort of hone their efforts in making sure this person's doing what they're supposed to be doing. But I have had low risk offenders go on to do horrific, horrible things that I have learned about because they were still in treatment. And so, of course, we learn about those. And I've had high risk offenders that work their ass off in therapy and get to a level of what we would call maintenance because for some of the federal crimes like Scott was talking about, especially with um, possession of child sexual abuse images. People would get lifetime probation, which means they have to be in treatment for the duration of their probation, which is lifetime. So what do you do with those folks, especially in an ethical way as as clinical and licensed psychologists? Do you keep somebody in treatment forever? So we would get them to a maintenance phase where they were maybe coming in once a month, but they had to do a lot of work to get there. Um, and I had some I had some high risk people who had done the work who we were comfortable enough scaling back the treatment to where they were, if you will, kind of coming in for a check in and doing the bare minimums because they were doing it every day in their lives that we were able to have them articulate or have the probation officers confirm for us. But it's it's tricky. I mean, you you have some confidence in the tools, but it is not, you know, it's not a predictor of human behavior, whether it's collectors of abuse images, or if it's people who have had contact offenses, there's a population there that is aware. They know that there is cross wiring in their head and they know that it's wrong and they feel awful for doing it. They feel awful that they have these urges. And those are the ones that for, for me were the most fulfilling to work with because they, they're so hungry, you know, for understanding and to please help me, help me help me have my tools, be my support system so that I have to be committed and responsible to you as the clinician. And people don't really talk about that. The ones that are aware. And I mean, I think the, the one that Shiloh and I were internally sort of wide eyed about was, you know, one of the older gentlemen in one of our groups that just had that almost delusional quality about his offenses that the kids were flirting with him that a four-year-old was, was flirting with him. Oh, you know, they all do it. They all do it. All kids. They're like all trying to seduce you. And so then you realize like, well, not only is this person wired differently, this person is delusional. Like he really, mm -hmm. per the, he perceives and interprets data coming towards him in a completely incorrect manner. How do we work with that? So there's just all whole spectrum of challenges that are hard. Yeah. But fascinating. And again, we have this phenomenal clinical director who was just gave the best supervision. She was so smart. Well, when you talk about that, how do you feel working in that space with sexual offenders in terms of resources? Do you feel like the community's safe or do you think there is holes in the system that could be filled in? Because, you know, from the outside, not a lot of people get to peek behind that curtain and go, mm -hmm. okay, what's actually going on? to make us safe from these predators. Yeah, it was very fascinating the time in which I started coming into that. So my first practicum and um, year working with them was 2006. And there was a lot sort of going on legally around that time, especially here in California. California and Florida seem to have been kind of the leaders as far as 
what are we going to do with sex offenders when they get out into the community? How are we going to structure laws around that? How are we going to structure mental health and resources around that? And sometimes with being the leaders, the pendulum swings really far. And then you have to figure out like what the sweet spot is for that. And oftentimes a lot of these laws come out of really horrific cases, right? Like horrible cases in which there was a crack or slip in the system where you know, afterwards, again, the parents are making it their life to advocate for this never happening to another family. And while I am 100% behind that, sometimes because of emotion, laws get written really quickly and without as much a forethought as there should be or without consulting people who do research in this area. So one of those things that was happening around 2006 was what we call Jessica's Law, which was essentially saying that offenders could not live within 2,000 feet of a school or a park or anywhere else that really like children congregated. And I, I had a different brilliant supervisor at this time who said, this is going to be a bad idea because it's going to actually put the population at a higher risk for their safety. And I was looking at him, I was like, what? Like, what, what are you talking? Yeah. And here, like, I'm a cop, right? Like, I was still a cop, like, working yeah. at this time. I'm like, I don't know, buddy, but it sounds like a pretty good idea to me. <laughs> yeah. Until you realized he was looking years down the road. He just had that kind of mind. But the research started coming out that, sure enough, it made it so impossible for people to find a place to live mm. that what it did was it elevated their stress and their instability which were actually risk factors that put them in a place to reoffend. So we were creating a system that was actually upping their risk and therefore putting the public at risk. And it was so silly when you thought of it. They could stay, like, let's say they come out into the community and their mom's, their parents' house is too close to a school. They're not allowed to spend the night there because that means living, but they can hang out there all day. Right. Well, when are kids in school? They're in school during the day, not in the middle of the night when people would be sleeping there. Um, the law that actually put a sex offender registry together, Jacob Wetterling's mother was really integral in trying get, in getting that started. And that was in a different state, but it went nationwide. And she would actually speak at our conferences and talk about how she thinks the registries had gone too far and were actually creating so much stress in these offenders that it was contributing to you know, some of their decisions to reoffend. So that was really interesting to follow as well. It's just mind blowing information. You know, I was all like you were probably thinking that's a great idea. And then the sex offender register, great. I want to know if there's somebody living on my street near my kids. But that cycle is just absolutely, mm -hmm. you know, how do you communicate that to a community to make them feel safe? Well, it's hard to do. Yeah, it's really hard to do because, again, not saying that the entire world is delusional, but many people react from a place of fear. This is something that, mm. you know, um, Very true. we again, we, you know, we we stoke the fire of fear and crime without looking at the actual statistics. And because this is about protecting children, which becomes a buzzword, what people want to do is they just want to be blanket about it. They want to go just get rid of them. Get, get them away from us. And again, they're not taking in the big picture of this is going to be complicated because again, if someone is forced to live under a bridge and their stress levels are high and then their only coping mechanism is some maladaptive behaviors, you're actually increasing the risk and the, the opportunity for more offenses to happen. But that's already, you know, you just lost the public. How can you make that into a pithy sentence that goes on a public service announcement. It's just impossible. Mm, yeah. Yeah. And I think like if I were to ask you, Sarah, what do you think the percentage of offenders who reoffend, let's just say across the board, big umbrella, just sex offender, what would you guess it is? Wow. Reoffending sex offenders. I would think it'd be quite high. And I'm literally got no basis for this. But I'm gonna say above 60%. Yeah, I think most people say 50 to 100 percent. I've heard 100 percent, of, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it's 15, one five. Every one of those percentage points is a person. Like, I, I'm not downplaying this. Right. At but all. What that tells me is there's something that's working. 
in the system. Well, and sometimes it's just intervention. It's just being arrested that we really see does it for some when you break it down into certain types of offenses like juveniles and actually those that possess child pornography. They're the lowest risk to reoffend, the lowest groups. So, yeah, I mean, definitely the higher risk groups falls into more of the psychopathy driven contact offenses or right. those that are really predispositioned to have an attraction towards what are the two rarest things, it, which is either prepuess and children or to violence, which would be your, your adult rapists. Mm hmm. I did not know this conversation was going to take this quite deep dive into to sex offenders, but it's absolutely fascinating. But I do want to switch gears a little bit because I know that you've kind of worked on both sides of the coin, haven't you? You've worked with the offenders and then you now both work with law enforcement supporting them. Can you speak to a bit about what your days look like now? Well, we're going to leave today's episode there and pick up next week with Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh. So plenty more to come on the twists and turns of a career in forensic psychology. Don't forget you can listen now to the second half of the interview on Patreon or if you're on Apple, simply hit that subscribe button and not only will you get early access to ad-free episodes, there's also loads and loads of bonus episodes on there to binge as well. In other news, uh, I just wanted to share that I am just back from CrimeCon Glasgow and CrimeCon Orlando, so it was a busy month. But I just wanted to share what an absolute pleasure it was to meet so many listeners of Stop the Killing. We had some amazing discussions, everything that you can imagine from guns, guns, guns to active shooter drills in schools. Plus, we had so many listeners of the other podcasts that I host, Con in the Con, Clueless, the Bravery Academy, and the Guilty Greenie who hadn't discovered Stop the Killing. So hopefully we've got a few of them listening right now. And if you are, I just wanted to say welcome and thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening. And if you want to know more, Catherine's book, Stop the Killing, is out now. For more details, go to katherineschweit.com. Please consider also supporting our independently made podcast. It's simple to do. Go to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing. And for as little as the price of a latte a month, you can be part of the solution to stop the killing. Patreon rewards range from official do-gooder status to ad-free episodes, autographed books, and opportunities to connect with us directly for your business, school, church, or even just a book club chat. But just knowing that you are part of a movement that has the power to make your community safer, well, that's got to taste better than a skinny cappuccino any day. So please head to patreon.com forward slash stop the killing now and polish off your do-gooder halo and make sure to include your name so we can give you a shout out. This podcast is a community podcast production. That's con with an N. If you want more content, then head over to Community Podcast at Instagram, where you'll find trailers on more binge-worthy true crime, like the award-winning podcast Conning the Con. And check out our show notes for all the links mentioned. Finally, if you want one takeaway action that you can do right now that can help make our community safer, Please share, rate and review this podcast wherever you listen. Everybody needs to know that they hold the keys to see something and say something. Together, we can stop the killing. It's one of those things you hope never happens, but you better train for it. Because it will happen. And it will happen in places you wouldn't expect. Be ready for it. <laughs>